Hi everyone, today we're going to be spending our time on the topic of basic scientific methods so that we understand how scientists document their inquiry. You're going to need to take notes on this topic, so before you get to the major part of this video, you want to set up your notes. I suggest setting them up in Cornell style, following the example below. Scientists agree there isn't any one way to do scientific inquiry. However, in order to communicate with one another and to make sure that during peer review they have included everything that they need, there are a few things that they've decided need to be a part of experimental design. For this video, we have broken this down into five sections, which we will be talking about in this video. Scientists will start an inquiry because of something they've become interested in, either because of an observation of a previous experiment or experiment of a colleague, because of something that they've read, or phenomena that they have observed out in nature or elsewhere. In order to begin their investigation, they take their observations and they create a problem question. Something that is simple and something that is testable. There are many questions that are very worthy of examination, but are not scientific because we can't gather evidence to support or refute them. And those are questions that belong in other branches of study. If the question is testable, it will be easy to write a hypothesis, which is the next step. The hypothesis will tell us something about the variable the scientist wants to test, and it allows the scientist to use her expertise to predict the outcome of the experiment. Because we are new at this, we're going to use a format to help us. It is called the if-then structure. If I do blah, blah, blah in the experiment, then I expect that blah, blah, blah will happen. For example, if I raise the temperature of an egg for five minutes, then I expect that the condition of the egg will become solid. It's pretty clear what the experimenter is going to do. I can see the action that they will be taking, and I can also see the prediction of the outcome. Predicting an outcome simply and clearly can be problematic for many experiments. As a result, many scientists rely on a null hypothesis to make this easier. A null hypothesis predicts that the action of the scientist will have no impact on the outcome and that after the experiment, the measurements will remain the same. Changing our previous hypothesis to a null hypothesis is going to change the second statement. If I raise the temperature of an egg for five minutes, then I expect that the condition of the egg will remain unchanged. Remaining unchanged is what makes this a null hypothesis. This also means that when we finish the experiment, it is likely that our hypothesis will be refuted. Next, the scientist needs to document the experimental design. Other scientists reading about the work will need to see that the scientist created a controlled experiment that generated data in a way that ensures that the variable we tested was responsible for the outcome. This requires that several design elements be identifiable, and you will need to identify those in any experiment that we do or that we read about. First is the independent variable. This is the element that the experimenter is going to manipulate and is the whole point to the experiment. It's found in the if statement of the hypothesis explaining what the scientist will do. A controlled experiment has only one independent variable. In this hypothesis, I can see that the experimenter is planning to raise the temperature, which means the temperature is the independent variable, or IV, in this particular experiment. The dependent variable is the variable that needs to be measured or counted or observed. We're looking for what changes have happened as a result of the experiment, and these are found in the then statement. They are actually what we predicted in our hypothesis. We can actually have more than one dependent variable in a controlled experiment. In this hypothesis, I can see that I'm going to be observing the condition of the egg, and this is going to be my dependent variable in this experiment. A controlled experiment is one that sets up a basis for comparison to use in order to recognize changes that have happened in the dependent variable at the end of the experiment. There are three types of controls, and the first is an untreated sample. An untreated sample sets up the most reliable comparison. The scientist will create an experimental group that's exposed to the IV, that could be the temperature change on the egg, but then sets up a second experiment with an untreated group called the control group. No temperature change here. Any changes we see in the experimental group that we don't see in the control group can be attributed to the IV change or the temperature change. Comparison between groups is when we don't have an untreated sample. However, we do have several different groups that can be compared to one another. And any changes that we see 
create a pattern that we can use to answer our question. The last type of control group are natural or standard conditions, which are a little tricky. In this case, there's an established value for our independent variable that we can use for comparison. For instance, 350 degrees is the recommended standard condition for baking a cake. If I change the temperature as my independent variable, I would then compare my results to the standard temperature of 350 degrees. In a controlled experiment, only one thing should change, the independent variable. This means everything else should stay unchanged or constant. The egg should be the same kind. It should be the same size. It should be treated in the same way, exposed to the temperature for the same time frame. Keeping these factors constant ensures that we can attribute any changes to the independent variable. Phew, all that planning, but now that we're done, we're ready for the fun, for the data collection. Now we need to be careful when we do this because setting up is so tedious. We want to make sure we collect everything at the time we're doing the experiment. We don't want any repeats. So we can collect both quantitative and qualitative data, and we need to put them in an organized chart form that should have a title and labels and units. We can't really go back and do the experiment again, so we need to get everything at the time the experiment is happening. The data that we collect is going to need to be analyzed, and one of the ways that we can do this is mathematically. You can see a list of the types of mathematical analysis that we may do in this class. You can see it's a pretty extensive list, but we will help you with each of the experiments that we do to know what kind of analysis you need to do and how to do that correctly. We can also analyze graphically. One of the graphs that we can do is a line graph, which is designed to show patterns of change and relationships between our variables. We can usually tell when a line graph is needed because our data will be two sets of numerical data, sometimes even more than that if we have more than one dependent variable. Some data is best analyzed with a bar graph, which is a visual comparison when we have categories that have numerical values that we want to compare. You can see how easily those patterns can be seen on this kind of graph. Pie charts are visual comparisons when we want information comparing how parts of an entity compare to one another for one variable. You can easily see the magnitude of the differences that exist in a pie chart. When all of the analysis is complete, we have what we need to state our claim, which is the answer to our experimental question. Scientists generally then follow this with a long explanation that supports the claim. We will only be asking you to write a paragraph. Because we are novice scientists, we will be using the CER format as our guide. It should start with a clear claim statement and be followed by a methodical presentation of evidence and reasoning using an established scientific rule. When it is completed, it should show our understanding of the experiment and how it connects to our class content. Observation, hypothesis, experimental design, data collection and analysis, and conclusion and reasoning. These are the steps of the scientific method.